Hi, welcome to our fifth chemical kinetics lecture. Uh, as you can probably tell from the t-shirt, I'm recording these straight after each other, just in case you th thought I was, you know, spreading this out or not. I'm kind of doing them in bits and pieces. Uh, now, previously, we looked at something called the initial rates method. That's if you got three kinetic runs and you took three rate constants from some experiments, uh, you could solve for your rate law and <clears throat> your rate constant k. Uh, now I'm going to look at something called first order reactions, so those are the really simple ones, uh, and a very um, neat little approximation called the pseudo first order approx uh, approximation. And those allow us to get a rate constant for any first order reaction from a single experiment really quite quickly and easily, um, <clears throat> and we're going to determine k from that. Uh, now there are some other ways of doing this via Excel, but you remember if you watched the whole of the last video, I give a little bit of a tutorial on Excel. I'm going to do the, uh, this one separately because there are two methods. You can do it graphically, you can do it by simulation. Um, again, it's not going to be examined, but you can watch that video anyway. But this one is going to be the explanation. The next video is going to be kind of the procedure for how to do it. So what am I going to cover in this one? First order reactions. <clears throat> what are they? Um, know that they are basically one thing goes to another okay what's the equations look like and so on and a pseudo first order reaction as you can probably guess from the word first order it's going to be very similar to a first order but thanks to that word pseudo why is it slightly different uh, then we're going to look at some actual data uh, and how it would work and then determine g uh, k our rate constant graphically so it's a we're going to be able to draw a graph and get a k value out of it. So if you've seen some of my intro videos, I sketched a graph out like this and said there's a gradient is equal to k and so on. Uh, this is the part we are now going to cover. So let's get on. So a pseudo first order reaction, well, not sorry, not a pseudo first, this is an actual first order reaction. Uh, this will, a uh, basic dissociation pretty much follows first order kinetics. Um, this is where our rate is dependent on only one variable, and that is the concentration of the starting material. So our rate, uh, our change of A, B uh, is proportional to, oh, this should be B, I'm really sorry, that should be B, I will change it. <coughs> uh, so just the rate of the starting material uh, disappearing is equal to that. So we have a nice exponential decay curve that we could measure, say, spectroscopically. Uh, and here's a reaction example. So two peroxide molecules breaking down to water and oxygen. Uh, once again, you know, microscopic, symbolic, macroscopic. Think about all the different ways we can actually look at kinetics and which different perspectives we can see it from. All the exact same thing going on. So this is a first order reaction. Uh, so let's have a look at <clears throat> something goes from one thing to the other. Let's have a look at what it would look like over time. You see one decay, that's the reactants. The products appear. So it's B, that's A. Uh, I've written this as more fractions, so this would be like 100% of A going to 0% of A or 100% of B here. So at the very end, uh, and the rate is proportional just to a <clears throat> single factor, and we can define that kinetically via our differential equations. Now, this is something here, I'll, we'll cover this in a bit more detail later. It is called the integrated rate law. So how to get this um, is, well, it's integration. So if you are comfortable with calculus and differentiation and integration, you should be able to get from uh, this equation to this one, no problem. Uh, but in short, the integrated rate law is basically what predicts these two curves that you can see. Uh, what you can see here is A is equal, uh, well, the concentration of A at a particular time is equal to the concentration of A at time zero times an exponential to the minus kt. Okay, that looks a bit weird, but that is why this decay happens very gradually in a nice exponential fashion, uh, because it follows that law. Now, if you see, uh, let's rewrite it out as a different way. 
if you might see an integrated rate law like this. Um, it means it's pretty much exactly the same thing. Um, delta T. Uh, basically, instead of saying initial concentration, we're just going to pick an arbitrary time and then an arbitrary time plus a slight gap. So if we were going to do the simulation method where we try to simulate race constants, we might use this method a bit more. Um, it produces pretty much the same result as long as you're consistent. In fact, this is kind of the same thing as this. We're just saying that T is, in this case, we're just saying T is zero. Uh, and the delta time is, well, whatever the time is, um, produces the same results, give or take. Uh, so an obvious first order reaction is something like peroxide decomposing. So in this kind of video, hopefully the screen captures gets the GIF here. Uh, you've probably seen it at the elephant's toothpaste. That's pretty much a first order reaction. It is peroxide breaking down, well, in this case, catalytically, but pretty much of its own accord according to just the concentration. Uh, a second order reaction. So we've come across this sort of thing before. This is the sign of thing like a nucleophilic addition. So this is an elementary step. Um, this is a single step. It is <clears throat> the simplest chemical reaction. So this is not obviously the end product of a reaction. This is just kind of a single step. So this means we can do things like K, A, B to determine the rate. So again, we're only interested in elementary steps. If we've tracked an entire reaction, as in what does this then proceed on to, we have to determine it experimentally. But for the most part, we can say this is second order. Two things are coming together, so therefore the rate is dependent on two concentrations. So here we have a OH coming in, targets a ketone group, and there's, ooh, again, I should pay attention to my own, um, diagrams here, there should be a CL there, uh, and it's nucleophilic addition, so that's a second order reaction. So how does that work out as, well, the rate is proportional to two things, and we can define that as the speed that the two reactants disappear, or the speed that C appears. Now, this is a slightly different plot, because I'm actually now doing this not as a mole fraction, I'm doing it as absolute moles. So the blue line here, uh, say that that's two moles. We start with one mole of that and one mole of this, and that will obviously, because this combination, go to one mole of that. So we're talking about discrete chemical entities when we're talking about moles, hence why we do concentration in moles in kinetics. So obviously by the end of the reaction, we've got zero moles of that left and one mole of this. So here we go. So it doesn't quite swap one to one in this case, um, <clears throat> but the rate of each of these individually, this is not one of those um, well, we could do it as a squared um, if you want, but <clears throat> for now we're keeping them distinct. Uh, but what if we had a lot of B? We'd actually have a plot that looked like this. This wouldn't in fact go to zero. This would stay quite a bit above zero because we can only do one mole of this plus one mole of that to one mole of C. So what if we started with about 10 moles of A and then we added one mole of B, uh, well, we'd get <clears throat> one mole of C out and then nine moles of A left over. There's nothing left for it to react with. Uh, so as a result, one of the concentrations isn't changing very much. So, and in this case, well, I've actually ever written that one wrong. Uh, <clears throat> in this case of the diagram, it's B that's unused. So B is in an excess. So you're used to this in chemistry, something is in excess. So what's the consequence of that? Well, have a look at this sort of scheme here. We've got the exact same uh, nucleophilic addition as before, uh, but we've got a lot of OHs left over. So one, two, three, four, five, six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them over here. Seven of them over here. Uh, so <clears throat> we've got a lot of excess. Over, and these aren't going to react at all. So let's look at the kind of the mathematical consequences of this when we look at the rate. So we actually stick some numbers in here. Uh, these are, you can see that's a vast excess. So that's 0 0.03 moles per decimeter cubed as a starting number. That's a 
really minuscule amount compared to say 0.5 moles per decimeter cubed of the other of B here. B equals A. Uh, so we can then multiply this out to get a rate and the rate will be K times this value, K times this value, and K times that value. So that means the rate is decreasing as the concentration of A drops and obviously the concentration of B is dropping as well, but only slightly. So 0.01 moles of this react. So 0.01 moles of this disappears each time. So you can see each of these are dropping by minus 0.01. But obviously this is dropped by a third. This is dropped by just over a percent. And so I'm going to make an approximation in the next screen. I'm not going to know what the concentration of B is. I'm just going to assume it's 0 .0, uh, 0 0.95 each time. I'm going to assume B doesn't change because it is in such excess. I'm just going to take that value as the value of the initial concentration. So if I set up a reaction that has B in it, I know how much I put in at the beginning. I know how much A I put in at the beginning. Uh, and I'm going to assume B doesn't change. And I get these values out. So I've actually calculated these values. These are exactly right. You can check the maths if you want. And what you will find is compared to the previous values, notice they hardly change. They're in fact uh, only within a couple of percent. So obviously it gets, as the reaction proceeds a bit further, uh, they do start diverging a bit. Uh, this is within 2%. If this kept going, it would probably, or if, you know, if A was in a bit more excess and was allowed to um, proceed to the end, obviously this would begin to, this approximation would definitely stop holding. So <clears throat> at the beginning of a reaction, when our thing is in excess is still in excess, the pseudo first order approximation applies. That is, we can assume the concentration doesn't change. So what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that we can simplify our rate equals K A B equation to something else. K is constant, B is constant. We can change that into something called K observed. Now, this is where a bit of notation comes, uh, gets a bit confusing. Now, depending on which lecturer you talk to or which textbook you read, K, the observed rate constant, the pseudo first order rate constant does change. Uh, I prefer K obs because this is literally the observed, it's short for. Observed, my handwriting is terrible. Uh, so it's the observed rate constant. If we got some data out of this particular reaction, and that's the rate constant, we would be able to determine quite easily. It's literally uh, C, but sometimes K1, sometimes K prime, sometimes K something else. Um, K obs is the one I'm going to use. But if you are reading all the textbooks and all the sources, uh, get used to seeing slightly different versions. So let's look at some actual data. Uh, if A goes to B, we're just going to jump back to <clears throat> uh, covering a first order reaction now. So this is going A going to B, or it's A plus something that's in excess going to B. So maybe a catalyst, maybe another reactant. But either way, the pseudo first order approximation will apply. So we can treat it like a first order reaction. So it will have first order kinetics. This line, as we see, will behave as if it is a first order equation uh, and that it runs according to first order kinetics. Uh, now in real, li real life you're not likely to get these smooth perfect lines, you're more likely to get a little jaggedy nonsense number like this. So you can see it does still have that curve down but uh, see these don't fit very well, maybe one of these is slightly off. We've got enough data points but if you wanted to plot that out it would look a bit jagged. So <clears throat> Be aware that there is going to be some real data that is always a bit iffy. Now, we are going to cover something about errors and solving this in the lecture series later. But for now, be aware that your data can be a bit jagged. So we're going to plot and do some best fits more than anything else. So what actually controls this equation? We're going to assume that it's first order or pseudo first order. It runs according to that. This is the integrated rate equation. So the integrated rate law comes from our rate law. We just 
apply some integration to it. Um, and then we take it out of the log form to this. So this is a sort of an equation that predicts and models how the concentration will change and it becomes quite useful. Because if we take a log of it, uh, we actually get a linear equation. So this is, remember, physical chemists like y equals uh, sorry, plus c, there we go, minus mx, or y equals mx plus c. Um, other way, it's a linear equation. And as we can see, these four data points here form pretty much a straight line. These two don't. They're a bit off. Why would they be off? Well, if it's a pseudo first order reaction, remember as the concentration of B generally does decrease, it starts to diverge away from that first order behavior. You can't tell just by looking at a curve. Um, all rate look, curves look a bit just like exponential decay curves. A human eye really can't eyeball that very well. We turn it into a straight line, however, we can very much see that those do not fit. So those last things at the end, um, I've also converted that into seconds. Remember, keep it in seconds to make it uh, useful. We can see that those last two data points we can get away with. So we want the first you know, handful, four of data points, and then let's see what that looks like. So if we plot those, we get a straight line graph. And if we run a straight line through it, we get 0 0.079. That's the gradient. So there's the gradient out. K is equal to 0 0.079. It's a first order or pseudo first order reaction. So I will leave you to figure out what those units are yourself. I'm not going to tell you. You should be able to figure that one out. Uh, and that's it. So let's kind of review all that. There's a, quite a bit to take in. Uh, so first order reactions. They are really simple to plot. Rate is equal to K times a concentration. Um, uh, so we can solve for K really easily. So we, we did a bit of that towards the end. A pseudo first order reaction is, well, obviously the real rate is equal, is proportional to real K times A times B, but uh, suitably large. Um, if B is a high enough concentration, then the rate is actually, we can, KB is equal to K obs and solve for that, because that is more or less constant or at least it is constant at the beginning of a reaction for maybe the first, I don't know, first 80% of the reaction, usually the last 20% you just want to discard in practice. Uh, so obviously a pseudo first order reaction is as simple as a first order reaction to solve. You just take a log of the concentration, plot it against time, get the gradient. And so the data for these two types of reactions, we collect concentrations versus time. So that's our graph and then we plot log a versus time and we actually see that it's a straight line and the gradient is minus k so that is a y equals mx plus c graph really really simple Again, physical chemists love it when you can put things into a straight line so that's how you would solve a rate constant for a first order or pseudo first order um, reaction. I do go over through that again. Uh, if it didn't sink in first time, I'm going to go through and do this in Excel in another video shortly. Um, so that will cover two different methods. One 